Good morning and thank you for joining the WT Financial Group Limited Investor Webinar. My name is Jane Morgan and today I am joined by WTL's founder and CEO, Keith Cullen, who will be providing a company update and discussing the half year results. To ask a question throughout today's presentation, please use the Q&A function, which can be found at the bottom of your screen. But Keith, I'll hand over to you. Uh, thanks, Jane, and uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Jane, if you wouldn't mind flicking onto that next screen of the disclaimer, uh, I think we've all read that one before, but um, general advice only today and not a recommendation being made to invest in the company, but uh, hopefully you'll gain something out of the session in terms of both an understanding of uh, how the company has arrived where it is today, uh, an analysis of our results for the half year, and also I'm going to touch on uh, the outlook so uh, just for those of you that don't know the company, a, a brief um, summary, I guess, of the structure of the business is over the last few years, uh, having started our life as a direct-to-consumer financial advice business under the Spring Financial Group brand, in 2017-18, as we took the decision to turn our focus to what used to be known as the dealer group space that is now known really as the advice network space, um, and we've, through a series of acquisitions, established ourselves now as one of the very largest financial advice network operators in the country. So our wealth management, retirement planning and personal risk insurance services are delivered primarily through a group of well more than 400 privately owned advice practices whose advisors operate as authorised representatives of one of our now four different cohorts under our Sentry, Synchron, Wealth Today, and since uh, mid-December last year, our Millennium 3 uh, brands and subsidiaries. And together with our Wealth Advisor uh, Hub, uh, these form what is known as our B2B or Business to Business Division. Our B2C division is that initial business of ours, Spring Financial Group, albeit on a, a much smaller scale than uh, what we had reached in 2017 when we commenced a process of disposing of a number of the assets in that group. Uh, Spring Financial Group delivers services directly to consumers still, and um, uh, those services include retirement planning advice, investment advice, and accounting and tax. Whilst we've brought together these four different and disparate businesses is we've been able to gain incredible um, uh, efficiency. And the way that we've done that is, importantly, we've retained these business to business brands of Wealth Today, Century, Synchron and Millennium 3, because there's a lot of uh, legacy uh, invested in those brands and uh, they each have a strong reputation in the market. Um, those brands are not consumer facing brands. So it doesn't cost us a lot to retain the individual brands, uh, but the cohorts of advisors that uh, exist in those networks have a strong affinity with the brand. In many cases, they've been associated with those businesses for 20 years or more. So we've felt it important to retain those uh, uh, different brands, but to ensure we're driving operational efficiency We've created our Wealth Advisor centralised support hub, and it is through Wealth Advisor that we deliver all of the key services to the advice practices that we support. We have a single approved product list, which is the products that the advisors can use. We operate a consistent policy suite across each of um, the cohorts of advisors. All of our core education and training for advisors is delivered through the Wealth Advisor brand. So regardless of which cohort uh, the advisors are in, they're all coming to a consistent education and training program. We've got a large suite of consumer engage engagement and marketing tools that we make available to the advisors in each of the cohorts. And again, this is consistent. We've been able to negotiate a very strong professional indemnity insurance program by combining uh, all of uh, the subsidiaries into a single policy. Our remuneration management is all centralised. And importantly, the risk management framework, or what others might call the compliance framework of the business, 
is all centralised into that Wealth Advisor Hub and it's consistent across the group with the same personnel bringing their intellectual property to bear right across the group. We also offer estate planning services under the Wealth Advisor um, uh, brand through our uh, Wealth Advisor Legal Services, which assists advisors in delivering estate planning solutions to their clients. And our advisor recruitment and also the practice management and support services that we provide the practices in the group that help them make their practices more efficient and help them grow their own revenue and profitability, that is all centralised now too. I should say for Millennium 3, as it's a very new acquisition for us, just completed on the 8th of December uh, last last year. So um, Millennium 3, we're in the process of really integrating it into those central services of ours still now. So there are some staff at Millennium 3 that are dealing exclusively with uh, the M3 practices uh, still, but we'll be working through that over the next six months to fully in integrate Millennium 3 uh, into the group. Uh, and that just sitting there, our B2C financial advice, accounting and tax, we call that our research and development lab. Whilst it's a small contributor to revenue, it's a, it plays a very important role in the network in so much as it it, uh, it keeps it real for us. Is in We don't need to second guess what legislative or regulatory changes or market changes might have on an advice practice or on their clients because we're living and breathing that direct consumer component uh, ourselves every day. And in fact, Spring Financial Group operates itself as, an, as a corporate authorised representative of, uh, of our Wealth Today subsidiary. That's some background on the business. Uh, before we delve into the financial results for the half year, a quick look at what our key drivers to revenue are. So each of the advice practices in our networks will pay us uh, some form of base fee. So that's a minimum fee that they pay for the practice to become a corporate authorised representative and for the individual advisors in the practice to also uh, be authorised. Then import importantly, and it's a bit of a differentiator for us uh, against a number of our peers, is our interests are very aligned with our advisors because uh, a good contributor to revenue and profits for us is our share in advisor revenue. Um, we then have additional services that we sell on a user pays basis to the uh, uh, to, to practices, attendance at, at, uh, at conferences, for example, and um, their fees will vary depending upon uh, the amount of advice they're writing uh, because they're paying us to participate in that risk management framework of ours. Um, we have licensee and advisor services. We make our uh, all of the education and training and other services that we offer through the Wealth Advisor brand uh, out to uh, people outside of our network as well. And then, of course, we have our direct-to-consumer revenue, which are the fees that we charge our own retail clients for uh, financial advice and also for accounting and tax. So they're the key components to revenue. So let's have a look at the half year. Uh, we were really pleased with the result uh, for the half year. Uh, it was an interesting one because uh, Gross revenue uh, was down slightly. However, most significantly, both EBITDA and net profit before tax were up. Uh, so we had a, an 8% uh, increase in EBITDA and a 7% increase in net profit before tax. And I'll take a dive into why that was so pleasing for us. Um, it was really driven out of our core B2B business or B2B segment being the, uh, being the advice network operations. Slight reduction in NPAT on the prior corresponding period, and that was through somewhat of an anomaly, even though the net profit before tax was up uh, across the two periods, is we had uh, an income tax benefit that manifested in the prior corresponding period versus an income tax expense in this period. So, um, you know, the income tax benefit improved the uh, profit before tax position in the prior corresponding period. Um, whereas the tax calculation uh, reduced it in this period. I'll just say, as far as tax is concerned, the company does have the benefit of considerable carry forward tax losses. So whenever you see us reporting an income tax benefit or expense, um, that, that adjustment will be a, an adjustment to uh, deferred tax assets or liabilities rather than a cash payment that's arising at this stage. So 
Um, and another thing to say about tax is we're in through the consolidation of these different businesses through our acquisitions over the last few years, we've landed in a very unique position of having the benefit of those carry forward tax losses, yet also having a significant uh, franking credit balance in our uh, in our franking account as I think some 1.7 or 1.8 million dollars. Uh, one of the key things that pleased us about the two corresponding periods was that we've managed to not only contain costs, but reduce costs. And what we're seeing is um, the real benefit of scale and the successful integration of these disparate businesses that we've acquired. I mentioned bringing everything together under that Wealth Advisor hub so that we can not only drive efficiencies in our business, but also ensure that all of the intellectual property and all of the personnel that are available in the group are available to support advisors regardless of which cohort they're in. So if you have a look down the expense lines, we, we did increase marketing expense uh, in, in the, uh, across those two corresponding periods. But the, the, you know, the key component of our expenses in this business is definitely employees. We're, we're, a, we're a professional service business after all. So it's headcount that, um, that really matters, both in terms of providing resources and also uh, where your cost base sits. And so we've managed to um, retain, uh, slightly reduce actually down by 7%, um, our employee benefit expense and um, overall a down 4%. So a, a really pleasing result in terms of what we've been able to achieve bringing all these businesses together. Uh, a quick look at the balance sheet, um, looking at the overall uh, net assets up by 20% uh, on the prior corresponding period. Um, importantly, um, net current assets, a big turnaround. So as we've made a couple of these acquisitions over the years, part of the acquisition consideration has been us assuming liabilities that were sitting in those businesses. So um, that's been a, a big factor. It was particularly so for the Synchron acquisition. I, I could refer uh, those that are interested back to our detailed announcements around how the, uh, the, the acquisition price for Synchron was determined to see that. Um, that resulted in us having a net current uh, asset deficiency in that prior corresponding period. And you can see how the profitability of the business across the ensuing periods has enabled us to swing that around to uh, a net current asset position. So that's been a, a terrific turnaround in terms of strengthening the balance sheet across that period of time. Uh, we've landed at for the half year 7.9% uh, return on equity for the half year, so annualised out to a 15.8% uh, return on equity. So a pleasing result with, uh, we think, uh, plenty more upside to come. Just looking at the cash flow, um, very good operating cash flow across the period, uh, up 72% on the prior corresponding period. So we had positive operating cash flow of a bit over $1.8 million. Uh, that was uh, net of some uh, $750 odd thousand dollars worth of prior period accruals. Um, that most of that would have related to those uh, assumed liabilities in those uh, acquisitions that we'd made. So net of all of that, a very strong operating cash flow for the period. Uh, look, we basically ended the period where we started it, um, $80,000 differential there, uh, having paid out $2 million in cash for the Millennium 3 acquisition right towards the end of the period. Uh, so we ended ended the period at uh, $5.3 million of cash and cash equivalent. So uh, very pleased with uh, the financial stability of the business from both a balance sheet and a, and a cash flow perspective. So let's take a deeper dive into why we were so pleased with the result and what mightn't have sort of jumped out at um, investors and shareholders when they looked at it to start with is uh, looking at our core advice network operations or what we call our B2B operations is EBITDA was up very strongly on the prior corresponding period. So notwithstanding the fact that uh, revenue was uh, down slightly, that's the gross revenue, and I'll go through some components of that shortly, notwithstanding that that was down slightly, EBITDA was up some 19% in our core operations and the net profit before tax was up 20%. 
So really pleasing. Um, we, we also see there in the B2C um, uh, division or segment, um, a jump of 186 percent. Uh, that is somewhat skewed by, as I've noted here on the slide, um, the B2C division included a net gain on contract of $448,000 in that period, which was somewhat of an anomaly. Um, similarly, in the prior period, when you look and say, well, Keith, you've told us uh, corporate overheads and overheads are under control. How come here they've gone from, um, you know, uh, being, a, uh, being negative 1.1 to 2.2? Uh, in fact, in that prior corresponding period, there was a gain on contract associated with one of our acquisitions in the corporate revenue line there. And really that uh, that segment revenue for corporate is um, uh, should be generally more likely that 155, which is some rent and, uh, and other incidentals. Otherwise, uh, the, the, uh, the corporate segment doesn't really have its own revenue. So just a couple of anomalies there, but the key thing that, uh, that uh, investors should note is that strong improvement in both EBITDA and net profit before tax of the advice networks. So what's driving this? Uh, really interesting alignment between the network practices and, and us is really key. And a differentiator for us is that variable fee component that we have that strongly aligns our interests with those of the practices we support. And our share in revenue with the practices now contributes uh, around 38% of our net revenue from the advice networks. And that's up from 30% on the prior corresponding period. So if we just have a look at this first line on this table here, at the total advice network revenue, um, 78 million, down a little, 2 million on the prior corresponding period, but down 3%, but advice network direct costs down 5%, leading to our advice network having net margin, net gross margin of 7.1 million for the period against 5.7. So a 25% increase in the net margin. Just having a look at the component of revenue share that we have with the practices that we support, um, 74 down to 72. Now that's gross revenue that flows through the advisor's practices. And then having a look at the splits that go to the advisors, you'll have a look at then the line of our retained share. So our retained share has jumped from 2.7 million to 3.5, notwithstanding the fact that the uh, overall uh, revenue in the network um, dropped by uh, nearly a couple of million dollars or $1.7 million. Importantly, we're seeing our advisor, the, our share of advisors' revenue has gone up from 3.8% to 4.9%. And that's in large part been due to some rationalisation in the network. Now, those of you that have sat on these sessions with me before will have heard me talk about it being glory days ahead for advice practices and are seeing um, uh, demand from consumers certainly outstrip the supply of advisors available with the reduction in advisor numbers, you might be questioning, well, why has your why has the advisor revenue jumped? And I'll just take you through some rationalisation that we've uh, uh, had in the networks. Bear in mind, we've brought together very disparate businesses um, with different cultures, and we've set about integrating them into our business and making sure that we have complete alignment with the practices we're supporting. So we want our practices to be engaged with us. We want them to um, uh, be aligned with us both culturally, and we want them to be aligned with us in terms of future success um, through, for example, um, those revenue share arrangements that we have with them. So um, rationalizing the network across uh, financial year 2023 was an important component of us making sure that we had that total alignment with all of the practices and the advisors we support. So we'll have a look here, starting at the top of these tables here, the PCP, the prior corresponding period, um, the net weighted average number of advisors in the group across that period was 497. So we started that period with 526 and we had a net movement of negative 58 advisors. So we ended at 468. And so if I look at what our weighted average number of advisors across that period was, it was 497. So 
If I compare that to, I'm just going to exclude M3 in these numbers, which is the third line down here, excluding M3, you'll see in that these are six month periods, the prior corresponding period, then the back half of financial year 2023 is where we really set about this whole rationalization of the network across the second half of, or sorry, the first half of this year, the, the period that we're talking about is excluding M3 is then we've stabilized the network at, and in fact, we had a net gain of one. I mean, the reality of it was within that period is we were probably 10 off and 10 on or 15 off and 15 on. Bear in mind that these numbers include all of the advisors that not only are principals within the businesses, but they're also the employees of the businesses. So staff come and go very regularly. So there is this regular movement of individual advisor numbers on and off the register. But across the um, first half of this financial year, very stable numbers until we added in M3 on the, on the 8th of um, December. I think we had practical completion on the 11th, something like that. So we've really ended the period at 31st of December with 561 advisors. I've done a weighted average of that because um, 135 of those advisors were only with us for 20 something days. So for the purposes of these metrics that I've done below, um, I've used a weighted average because there was some contribution to uh, gross revenue and, and also margin from the M3 network, albeit for only three weeks. But to give us a proper mathematical look at what's happened um, with margin and with averages across the corresponding period to this period, um, it, it would be remiss of me not to add that weighted average in. So rather than using the 427 number, the weighted average comes to 443 advisors, individual advisors for that period. So let's have a look at um, how that lines up prior corresponding period to this period is gross revenue down 2.5%, net revenue to us about even at 9 million, but the gross margin to us up 25%. Now that's on a reduction of 10% of advisor numbers. So down from 497 to 443. So I think, you know, notwithstanding that rationalization of our network, um, we've been able to really focus on the practices that are growing that have strong alignment with us um, and that we have those um, strong reven revenue share arrangements with. And let's have a look importantly what that looks like per advisor. So if I have a look at the gross revenue per advisor, the prior corresponding period was 325 on an annualized basis and that's up 9.3% to 355. So we think there's still a bit of work to do there as in our view, um, advisors are still short selling themselves in the market. And we think there's a lot of growth um, uh, across the network available just by advisors getting their pricing propositions with their, with their underlying clients right. And it's certainly a big project for us to constantly work with them to help them improve both their own revenue line and also um, their own profitability. And that's, again, why it's very important for us to have that alignment with them. So net revenue to, uh, net revenue to us, um, up from $36,000 per advisor in the prior corresponding period, up 13%. Gross margin to us on a per advisor basis, up 40%. So we're absolutely delighted with the restructuring that we've done across the last couple of years. Uh, it's it's a, a credit to the entire executive team and staff of the business to have worked with those practices that we're aligned with to really ensure that um, uh, we're maximising not only their outcomes, but outcomes for ourselves and shareholders. I think that wraps us up in terms of the um, presentation of the results and we wanted to leave plenty of time for question and answers. I see some uh, coming in already. And I know Jane said she's had a few email to her as well. Um, won't bore you with the details again of, of uh, board and management, but this deck is available by release to the market. Uh, a very strong and committed team. Um, Chris Colessas founded this business with me back in 2010. Uh, we're delighted that Guy Headley has been our non-executive chairman since we first uh, listed in uh, 2014. And, uh, and last year, Chelsea Pottinger joined us um, as a non-executive director. So uh, a really good mix of 
a great experience in uh, financial services um, and also just the corporate world more generally, and certainly a great deal of equity capital markets and merger and acquisition experience uh, across the board. The executive team, those of you that have attended these before will know uh, David Newman and, and Frank Paul, Jack Standing and, and Rickton Jones. Um, again, uh, a credit to them and the management team underlying them who have done such an excellent job over the last couple of years of uh, integrating these disparate businesses together, uh, getting them it all with a common vision and improving uh, the underlying profitability of the, the, the practices in the group, uh, most importantly, uh, improving the, uh, the yield and the outcomes uh, from our advice network for ourselves and our shareholders. All right, Jane, I think that concludes us um, other than Q&A. So um, look forward to answering any questions people have. Absolutely. And um, please use the Q&A function, which can be found at the bottom of your screen, should you have any questions uh, for Keith. Um, let me jump into them now. So uh, what differentiates Millennium 3 compared to the other B2B licensing practices? Uh, look, I think for us, I think for us, it's quite aligned. I mean, what, what I think for Insignia, it wasn't so, right? So, I mean, Millennium 3 has been around for about 30 years, has a very proud history in personal insurance sales. So life and TPD and, and trauma sales and so on. Now, very, very big wealth management business as well in terms of the amount of investment advice being given in that group. But, but probably like Synchron was when we acquired it, a disproportionate mix of um, personal risk versus investment um, from what you'd normally see. And I think this is one of the reasons it didn't sit well inside Insignia. They're very focused on the wealth management aspects of advising, um, but it sits very well with us as, uh, you know, we've got one of the, uh, one of the biggest uh, personal risk books in the, uh, uh, in the country now, I think, um, $23 billion worth of funds under advice in our network is very significant, obviously, but we've got well over $400 million worth of enforced premium. And we've been getting around meeting with all of those uh, M3 practices. I think we're finding a really good cultural alignment. Um, so not a, not a lot different to, um, uh, uh, to the practices that were already in our group. Wonderful, thank you, Keith. And next one, so how are you gonna grow from here? Yeah, good question. I think, Jane, this is the key thing for us is there's lots of opportunities to grow, but our primary focus is to really take advantage of this supply demand imbalance that has arisen in financial advice in Australia. I mean, we are down now from a peak of uh, over 25,000 advisors in the country to now not much more than 15,000 in the country. And this is all happening at a time when People, the, the, there is this wall of people and a wall of capital moving towards retirement. So if you have a look at the, the growth in the 65 plus market in Australia, between the last two census, the Australian population grew by about 8%. But the people aged 65 and above, that cohort grew by 19.1%. So you've got this wall of baby boomers plus all the immigrants that came into Australia, um, you know, across the last sort of 40 or 50 years, 60 years, all moving towards retirement. And the asset pool that's most relevant in that case is superannuation. You've got superannuation at well over $3.5 trillion now. You've got statutory contributions on the rise all the time. And you've got a net gain in that asset pool of $2 billion a week. So there's this enormous demand that's arisen. And at the same time, you've got a restriction of supply and a real chokehold on supply because of the new education standards that are in place. So we think there's never been a better time to be in our space and also for advisors to be running their practices. So the biggest opportunity is to take advantage of that supply demand imbalance. We think still advisors are short selling themselves. Um, uh, we think there's a big opportunity for revenue growth uh, for advisors, for individual advisors and at a practice level. And also the key to that is we're participating in revenue with them. So we're very motivated to help them grow their revenue. I think advice networks that fix fees with their practices, the only way they can get more profitable is to cut the services they're providing to practices. 
And that makes no sense to me for either the practice or for uh, or for the uh, advice network. Whereas we can invest in personnel, resources and programs to help individual advisors grow uh, because we're sharing the upside with them. Now, in addition to that, um, you know, look, there's plenty of opportunities, I think, um, with new technologies emerging. Um, there's certainly opportunity for us to look at things like uh, separately managed account and model portfolio services across the network. Uh, we've got advisors asking us whether we'll move into that space all the time. So I think there's additional revenue streams that can come, but a core for us is just to keep growing the uh, revenue and profitability of the practices in the group. Thank you for that, Keith. Uh, so next one, do you think you'll retain all of the M3 practices you acquired from Insignia? Look, Jane, I mean, look, in, in a perfect world, I'd love to say yes, but the reality of it is um, what we find is when we do these acquisitions, the first thing is there was a lot, of, you know, Insignia came out and said they were selling M3 about six months before ultimately they managed to get the deal completed with us. So they're probably a little bit of looking around emerged in the in the network. Um, practices do come and go from advice networks and individual advisors do. Pete, there's a lot of merger and acquisition activity happens. We try and retain it within the group, but you can't always retain it in the group. So I'd say I'd love to, but the reality is, is there's no question that, you know, um, as we work through integrating M3 into the group is that there'll be some rationalisation there as well. And and look, we we've, we've paid what we think was a pretty handy price for the network. So um, it, it, we won't be shocked if we lose a few, but I'd, I'd love to hang on to, to all of them. Thank you, Keith. That actually probably answers the next few questions. There's a few ones here just on advisor numbers and what investors should be looking forward uh, to over the next sort of six months on those numbers. But um, we... I think, so. you know, I, Jess answers there. Do you think we'll see a continued decline in advisor numbers across Australia? I, I, look, I do think we will. You know, we're at 15,500 or something now. We've got new education standards triggering again in a couple of years' time where um, uh, people, if, they don't, if they're not captured by the 10-year experience pathway, uh, are going to, in, in many cases, complete pretty significant study just to continue doing what they're doing. So I would say that we're, you know, I won't be surprised if we, if we end up netting down to about 12 or 12 and a half thousand advisors in this country. Um, I'd like to see us retain more. I think the government should have extended its 10 year experience pathway to a lot, make the cutoff date closer to when that came in. That would have saved another couple of thousand advisors. Um, but yeah, I do think I do think we'll see the numbers net down, which is why I think if you're a practice principal out there now, um, there's no better time to be in this space from a supply demand uh, perspective, and it's and it's where we see the opportunity for ourselves to work with our practices to uh, to continually grow their revenue or profitability. Thank you, Keith. I'm jumping around a bit here. We've got lots of questions coming through. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Your peers all seem to have some form of product revenue from managed accounts, modelled portfolios and the like. So do you envision you will move to do uh, likewise? Uh, yeah, look, I mentioned that just a moment ago, Jane. It's definitely it's definitely a terrific opportunity for us. Is I think if you look across our listed peers, there's a number of them have a significant contribution from running uh, the likes of model portfolios and separately managed accounts. Um, we are very interested in that space, but the job at hand for us has been proving that you can make a profit out of running what is in effect a pure play professional services operation um, that we're running at the moment. Many have said that you can't make money out of advice networks. Well, um, without, you know, there being product in them, uh, such as the, uh, the institutional owners have had in the past. Well, I think we're demonstrating that you can and I think we've demonstrated that you can, we've been able to bring together these very disparate businesses, consolidate them, rationalise them, get them culturally aligned with, um, uh, with us and our, our thinking, and then really support their individual advisor growth. Now, doesn't mean we're not going to look at adding in um, additional revenue opportunities. And I'll say that in particular, the advisors that come from institutions, a lot of them are very used to having um, what I'd call head office model portfolios and 
head office separately managed accounts or managed discretionary account solutions available to them. And so when they join us from the likes of, um, you know, an AMP or so on, as um, there is an expectation that we'll have that. So, you know, it's an opportunity for us, but it's definitely been driven at from a demand perspective by advisors as well. Thank you, Keith. Next one. So uh, what are your points of difference um, in compared to your competitors? Um, and why would a practice choose you? Really good question, Jane. It, it's that cultural thing as well. So, I mean, I could tick through a few of our key points of difference. Um, I think we've got an advisor education and training program that is absolutely second to none. And um, I, I'd say it's world standard is we produce a lot of content for our practice principals and also the advisors in their groups. Most importantly, we, it's not just about collecting professional development points, our content, it's about practical application. And this is really born out of our history. It's in our DNA uh, because in our retail practices, we ran a graduate recruit program. And over the course of seven years, as we took nearly 70 kids straight out of university taught them how to monetize their profession and turn them into what I think are amongst the best advisors in Australia. So we love that practical application perspective of, of advisor education and training. It's not training for training's sake or training for points. It's training on how you can improve outcomes, improve outcomes for your clients with, within your practice and, uh, you know, reach your commercial goals. So it's a, we produce some 80 hours of live stream content a year, we do five uh, in-person PD days around the country that are also live streamed so that the whole network can watch them. We run a, our next gen conference for new advisors. We run our annual conference and we do a lot of special events talking about things like merger and acquisitions and how, how and debt versus equity in terms of running mergers and acquisitions for practices. So that's a key differentiator for us. But most importantly, I'd say from a practice principles perspective, we've really adopted this view of wanting to eliminate excess interpretation in our policy suite. I mean, I've heard people at ASIC be, say, stop whinging to us as financial advisors about there being too much regulation. You need to talk to your licensees about them overlaying stuff on top of our regulation. And so we've been really focused on removing all that excess, reg, excess interpretation from our policy suite to really try and streamline life for practices and make things less prescriptive and, and, and less um, uh, restrictive for them. Part of that is our mantra of wanting to minimize commercial interference in our practices. We're not trying to have this you know, homogenous group of advisors that are all doing the same thing. It's our mantra to get out of their way, back their professional judgment and help them deliver the type of the type of services to the types of clients that they want to. That makes us a very broad church. Now, to, to really encourage innovation and to encourage entrepreneurship like we do, what critically underpins that is a very unique thing that we run in how we run our compliance, what we call our risk management framework. We, we put advice at the centre of everything we do and our entire operation is geared around working with advisors to analyze and peer review every single piece of advice and every single file in a really commercially efficient manner to do it quickly um, before it goes to a client. So we call this, we've turned the lights on in the network. You know, there's a lot of fear and loathing that operates between advice practices and, and their, the networks that support them. And it's born out of the fact that the only time they go and look at the advice being provided is once a year, when they come in and turn the lights on and have a look at a random selection of files. The lights are on with us all the time, which enables us to encourage innovation and encourage entrepreneurship because we don't need to be worried about finding anything you know, that's been in the dark at the end of the year. Um, we'll catch anything up front and can work with advisors to refine it when they're wanting to innovate. So it, that's a really key differentiator for us. Um, and that's the practices that are aligned with us in that thinking. They're the ones we're working with to help them build their revenue and profitability. And that's another key factor is we can invest in our time and energy in helping practices grow their revenue and profitability um, because we're sharing in the outcome with them. So I think that's another key differentiator for us. 
Thank you, Keith. This one's popped up quite a few times. So what's the company's policy on dividends and do, do we intend to start paying them? And if so, when? Look, well, Jane, if you, if you just flick back on the slides as you have a look at our balance sheet, because there was another question about it, if you, if you are able to get it back up there, and we'll, I'll just point something important out on our balance sheet. Duck down out of the way there. If you have a look there, down issued capital reserves, accumulated dividends, this company's paid out 6.8 million in dividends in its history. Um, so I'd say to you that as and when the opportunity arises, um, you know, around 30% of this company is held by um, board and management and, and employees of the company is everybody working within here is certainly as motivated as any other shareholder for a dividend. Um, but um, if you hop onto our, the next slide, which is the cash flow slide, I think you'll see the, op the opportunity was there to pay a dividend at the end of last year. Um, we could have paid what would have been a three quarter cent dividend, I guess, as as, uh, as a dividend towards the end of last year. But then the opportunity to acquire Millennium 3 came along and uh, we arm wrestled it out at a board level and said uh, to be able to pick that um, terrific network up for uh, for two million dollars um, was was a much better way to deploy the available capital. Um, flip back to the balance sheet for me then, um, Jane. Uh, I'll answer that. Uh, I'll answer another question while I'm there, but I'll just finish up on this one. We're motivated to get back there. The business is, you can see from this turnaround in uh, on the balance sheet and what we've been able to do with net current assets in just 18 months um, from a from a cash flow and profitability perspective. Um, all the moon and the stars are aligning for it. Um, so we we retain a policy of um, of looking to pay dividends at least once a year. Um, had it not been for that uh, M3 acquisition, we'd have probably been declaring one at the moment, but we thought that was a much, much better capital management in those circumstances. Um, but we expect, this will answer another question there from uh, someone online, we expect this sort of level of revenue and profitability to continue and improve, bear in mind that half year um, only had 22 days of impact of those additional M3 advisors coming into the network. So. Um, you know, you can slide rule out what the uh, potential impact by that might be in the second half. And obviously then the next financial year um, looking very good for us will be our first full financial year with uh, with all of them um, integrated. Now, somebody said the decline in accumulated profits and losses. Yes, I guess, and that, that showed as a negative number. I guess that's the big turnaround is um, accumulated profits and losses sitting underneath the accumulated dividend line there at the end of the prior corresponding period um, was $3.2 million in the negative and it swung around to 800,000 in the positive. So it's about $4 million worth of profits dropped in between those two periods. So, um, um, all right. So next one, again, come, this one comes through a few times. So are there more acquisitions on the horizon? Look, I, I don't think so. The, the last few years for us have been a very deliberate strategy of bringing this network to the right sort of scale that can generate the right sort of margin in an advice network without just having to cut costs. So as this profession has modernised, it's been absolutely imperative for practices that want to modernise along with the profession to have access to a really broad range of services. Some of those things they only need on an ad hoc basis. It's imperative that their licensee has got them available as and when they need them. And to be able to afford to underwrite that, you need a certain scale. So that's what the that's what the strategy was about. Um, we've reached that now. We've proven that you can be profitable running one of these networks um, on, on a professional services basis. So... Um, we'll be looking in priority to any acquisitions. Now, I'll never say never because I probably said this same thing last year um, before Insignia contacted us and said, what do you think about this? And it was a, it was just too good an opportunity to pass on. So I'm not going to rule it out completely, but it's not part of our strategy. In, in, ahead of that in a strategy from um, a growth perspective would be getting more out of the network that we've already got in terms of helping the practices improve their own revenue and profitability, looking at kindred services that we can offer, such as separately managed accounts and so on that I've talked about already, 
and then from a capital management perspective, getting back to paying dividends. Thank you, Keith. Um, all right, next one. So other players are investing, other listed players rather, are investing in the practices in their networks. Uh, do you plan to do this as well? Look, I think there's all sorts of reasons why you might do that. And there's reasons that we believe it's more appropriate to adopt what I would call the quasi equity model. The first thing I'd say is that we've got 400 practices in the group. I can't go and invest in all of them. Right, like it would be insanity to try and invest in all of them. Um, I also don't want to be, you know, arguing with practices over what I think they should be doing versus what they should be doing. Our mantra is to minimise commercial interference and to encourage innovation and entrepreneurship. So well, that's why we're a very broad church. Um, but we are invested in those practices, Jane. We're, we're investing personnel into those practices because we have what I would call a quasi-equity relationship with nearly every one of them. That's you know, certainly all of the ones that are on revenue share with us. So we invest in them every day and invest in their growth. So that that's the approach that we've adopted. Thank you, Keith. And look, I think just finally, you know, what should shareholders be looking forward to for the next six months? Well, I think I think we've set a really good foundation now and having tucked Millennium 3 into the group, um, uh, you know, right towards the end of that period as we think that the future looks very positive for not only a continuation of that profitability, but uh, hopefully an improvement, certainly an improvement on it as we get Millennium 3 uh, fully integrated in. So, um, uh, and, and then, as I say, from a capital management perspective, as we'll certainly be working towards using those um, profits that are coming through into the business um, uh, to, to look to a return to dividends. Wonderful. Well, Keith, I think we've covered all the questions today. Um, thank you all for joining the WT Financial Group Limited Investor Webinar. If we've missed any of your questions, please feel free to reach out via the contact details on the bottom of our ASX releases. But we look forward to hosting you again next time. Thanks, Jane, and thanks everyone for joining us.